events, we have some flyers right over here uh, for you to take home with you if you'd like. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Kimberly Welsh is a doctoral candidate in the Theater and Performance Studies program at UCLA. Broadly speaking, her research explores the intersections of performance, homelessness, and incarceration, with an emphasis on spatial structures and their relationship to constructions of race, gender, and sexuality, Walsh's work addresses historic and contemporary forms of spatial disposition in Los Angeles and New York. And I present to you Kimberly Walsh. <laughs> it's great to have us all in the room. We don't usually get to do this, and our program looks a lot bigger than what I imagined. We're all here together. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking everyone who made today's lecture possible. So Jeanette for her introduction and for the tech support. The Bread Center for hosting the Circle of Thought series and providing this invaluable platform for graduate students to present their research. The Bench Center also helped fund my New Orleans research, in addition to the Institute for American Cultures, Shirley Hume Award. My mentor and longtime advisor, Sean Metzger, as well as <laughs> Professor Sarah Haley, who gave me the rundown on how to do archival research prior to my trip. I would also like to thank you all for coming to hear me speak today. Without you, literally without the PhD team, <laughs> it would just be me awkwardly talking to this camera. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Um, briefly, so today's presentation is about my research in New Orleans. So it's more of an exploration of the research that I found rather than me saying I'm arguing this. Um, so I see like notepads and <laughs> computers. <laughs> so just don't quote me yet. <laughs> Wait till after I've like, developed the chapter. But you have things to think about. Okay, so let's. Again, broadly speaking, my research focuses on the intersections of performance, homelessness, and incarceration, and the ways in which constructions of race, gender, and sexuality mediate how people navigate said sites of spatial dispossession. While the focus of today's lecture is my New Orleans research, I'm actually going to start with an example from the first chapter of my dissertation in order to elaborate the theoretical framework of the larger project, which is necessary to understand what I'm trying to get at in my um, when I'm looking at the I was so unimpressed with the city council. They had a line of homeless people who were allowed to vote because Kevin was running for councilman and everything, so they wanted IDs. The person tabling asked me, well, I need some ID. Do you have any ID? In the way he said it, he knew I wouldn't have any ID. It was like I wasn't even there. I was invisible. He was just going through the motions of making the sound but he didn't know if he was dealing with RCB. So when I dropped my passport, and I do mean dropped my passport, that's when I got respect. What does it mean to perform present selfhood? What conditions necessitate these kinds of performances? In the opening excerpt, RCB articulates an instance when transparency was mapped onto his body. During the election cycles of 2010, 2012, and 2014, Kevin Michael Key, a prominent, formerly homeless Skid Row activist and community organizer, ran for a position on the downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council. As part of his campaign, he sought opportunities to help homeless residents of Skid Row exercise the right to vote in the upcoming elections. One instantiation of this objective involved tabling in the neighborhood. In a show of support, RCB lined up to vote and subsequently encountered the tabler. In the way he said it, he knew I wouldn't have any ID. It was like I wasn't even there. I was invisible. As understood by RCB, the table did not expect homeless individuals to possess government-issued identification. Instead of acknowledging RCB's individuality or subjectivity, the table assumed that RCB's status as homeless meant not having ID. In this interaction, RCB's political subjectivity was under erasure, invisible. For RCB, in this confrontation, homelessness marked him as a knowable non-subject, a generic homeless man. Okay, so we're going to use this example to go into more of the theory, and this is the theory of me use to talk about Nukemba. Okay. In the popular imaginary, histories of the sites and subjects of spatial dispossession are transparent. 
Drawing on the work of Judith Butler, here, dispossession refers to processes and ideologies by which persons are disowned and objected by normative and normalizing powers that define cultural intelligibility and that regulate the distribution of vulnerability. Dispossession names the polyvalent ways non-normative bodies, subjectivities, and forms of community are rendered unintelligible, and the avenues by which the histories are erased from, fall out of, or never make it into the archive. Spatial dispossession then engages with the ways in which notions of physical, psychological, and affective space mediate and inform instances of dispossession. By recirculating images of black criminality, the lazy other, and other cliches, without putting these images into conversation with other spaces non-normative bodies occupy, media depictions of black, brown, and poor bodies reify historic stereotypes, articulating these communities as naturally predisposed to inhabit sites of spatial dispossession. For those of you just joining us, please take a seat. <laughs> Furthermore, the reiteration of aesthetics present in these images suggests the possibility of visually identifying dispossessed people. One need only think about the clothing, races, and gender associated with the American gangster or co-optation of Bubbo Sheep in the fashion world to see some of the ways in which conditions of spatial dispossession become tied to specific, racialized, and gendered aesthetics. As indexed by the opening epigraph, these images not only locate the spatially dispossessed through visual means, but also articulate the lives and experiences of these individuals as homogenous and consequently instantly identifiable. In their everyday lives, people in sites of spatial dispossession encounter stereotyped images legitimized by the media and the state. In the opening example, the tabler made assumptions about RCB based on his status as homeless and the tabler's understanding of what homeless entails. During the interaction, the tabler did not acknowledge the complexity of RCB subjectivity, the fact that RCB has a history outside of his then current situation, and that at any given moment, RCB engages a multitude of identifications that complicate commonsensical images and narratives, positing his body as a knowable homeless body. Actions by the policy and the state help reify the legitimacy of these commonsensical images. State practices, in combination with the almost daily recitation of stereotyped images of the homeless addict, the welfare queen, the violent black man, etc., work to cement the appearance of transparency. In demonic realms, black women in the photographies of struggle, Catherine McKittrick argues that transparent space, quote, assumes that geography, specifically physical and material geographies, is readily knowable bound up with ideologies and activities that work to maintain a safe economic clarity, and that this transparency goes hand in hand with the view of space as innocent, as free of traps, as secret places. The logic of transparent space permeates state-sanctioned and media depictions of homelessness and incarceration. By failing to discuss or nuance the capitalist logics propagating the overrepresentation of some bodies and not others in sites of spatial dispossession, these narratives map dispossession onto certain bodies as if homelessness and incarceration are the natural geographies of black, brown, and poor people, rather than the result of systematic disenfranchisement. For McKittrick, black geographies challenge the notion of transparent space. As a capitalist logic, transparent space functions to validate current spatial organization that supports the dispossession of low-income communities and communities of color. Transparent space contributes to the creation and reiteration of hierarchies of power that not only dispossess black, brown, and poor bodies, but also devalues and or refuses to recognize black life. As articulated by McKittrick, the flows of money, spaces, infrastructure, and people are uneven, and that built environment privileges and therefore mirrors white, heterosexual, capitalist, and patriarchal geopolitical needs. The collusion of racializing assemblages that help propagate and sustain the overrepresentation of black and brown people in sites of spatial dispossession then stem in part from these needs. Alexander G. Wahelier posits that racializing assemblages materialize as sets of complex relations of articulations structured in political, economic, social, racial, and heteropatriarchal dominance. Racializing assemblages help create and maintain stereotyped images and related affective responses to continuous recitation on multiple platforms. So here we're thinking about the media, um, institutionalized narratives of conquest, right, that you learn in your US history course, um, etc. As well as to the creation of institutions and laws positing the other as less than human or abject. 
The collusion of racialized assemblages supports capitalist logics creating transparent space, which in turn hides the racializing assemblages propagating spatial dispossession and burdens the individual as sole factor in said dispossession. In demonic grounds, McKittrick refers to geography as space, place, and location in their physical materiality and imagined configurations. And from there, argues that black geographies are some altern alternative geographic patterns that work alongside and beyond traditional geographies in sight and terrain of struggle. For McKittrick, an excavation of black geographies illuminates the topic of struggle. Spatial struggles that, in De Soto's rendering, have been forgotten through the mapping of stillness. By illuminating hidden spaces that are antagonistic to transparent space through mapping of movement, black geographies illustrate the role of movement in constituting space as well as the polyvalent ways notions of race, gender, and sexuality condition spatial practice, which includes the creation and transformation of space through community building as well as the physical act of moving one's body from place to place. Okay, so that was a lot of theory. Um, that was just to set up, have something for you to think about as we continue into the examples that we're going to look at for the combo. So now we're going to move on to New Orleans research. So, in my work with LA residents who are homeless, formerly homeless, and or formerly incarcerated, one of the key questions driving my project is what it might mean to seriously engage with not only the theorizations of individuals living inside the spatial dispossession, but also what it might mean to take their individual and collective spatial practices as theorizations of other ways of inhabiting the world. I approached and continue to approach my New Orleans research in a similar fashion. When I arrived in New Orleans, I knew what I was looking for. As suggested by Sarah Haley, I had done my pre-work. I had thoroughly combed through Amistad Research Digital Archives uh, more than a month in advance and knew the exact series, box numbers, folders, etc. that I wanted to pull and examine. So I contacted the archivist at the center and made sure that the materials would be accessible to me during the two weeks I planned to be in the area. While I was open to discovering hidden treasures, I was pretty keen on exploring the Free Southern Theater series. Briefly, the Free Southern Theater was a short-lived but very active theater company in New Orleans that was originally founded in 1963 in Mississippi but moved to New Orleans in 1965. The theater closed in 1980. However, before their closing, in the 1970s, they had a prison program. Or at least according to the digital archives, they did. So my second day in New Orleans, I pulled the FST folder labeled FST Prison Program. To my surprise, the folder contained interviews between defendants and their defense attorneys, and that was it. No context. I didn't know how FST obtained the transcripts, given how they were used, and the defendant's relationship, if any, to the theater which was disappointing, but at the same time, completely fascinating, right? So how did those interviews get there, and why were they there? Unfortunately, after coming through the FST series, which includes over 72 boxes, I was still unable to find context for those interviews. However, that search led me to the combo topic for today. You see Tom Dent, also known as Kush, and Kalamu Yasalam, also known as Val Ferdinand, were part of FST and organized a creative writing workshop through the organization called FST, but it was smaller called Black Art South. So that was the workshop portion of FST. In 1968, the workshop participants began publishing their work as a journal of creative writing, which was originally called Echoes from the Gumbo, but the name was quickly changed to Nukumbo, which is the Bantu word for Gumbo. Right? During its short-lived tenure, uh, 1968 through 1974, the journal featured writings from artists across the South, including writings by brothers in confinement. It is some of these writings in Nkambo's relationship to discourse about black femininity that I'm going to speak to today. Let's start with the June 1971 issue of Nkambo. Each issue of Nkambo is structured as follows. Cover, table of contents, A from the kitchen section, usually offered by Dent, that outlines the themes of said issue. This section is followed by food for thought, which is usually offered by Salon which sounds like what it is, something provocative for readers and contributors to think about. Then comes the core, aka the creative writings from primarily seven writers and or writers residing in the cell, that cover. So Kalmu Yasalam opens the June 1971 Food for Thought with his views on the present condition of black writing, more specifically, black poetry. Part three, which is why I'll be reading it up here, but this is a picture of the actual document. He states, there must be control. Not necessarily to say that everything has to be forced or that everything has to be alike, 
but there must be control. We are not children anymore, and Black Ryan is no longer new to us. Some of us, really, this be speaking to the bro and sis out there who've been at it for like the last three, four, five years. No time, no more, for escapes and miscellaneous freakish escapades in the name of blackness. Nor writing, just scribbling, black, 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 act. 5,000 times, with 60 niggas and a trillion fucks done in to make it real. Censor statement, there's going to be a few more niggas, fucks, and some other words coming up. This is FYI. Um, it's okay. Uh, to make it real and angry. Same old thing for the other way around. No more is black is beautiful, is beautiful, is beautiful, just as we write treat prettiness. That's God, man. It really is. After the 60s, it's a real shame that more of what we wrote don't actually exist. Where are all those bad niggas who are going to tear out funky tongues and jam them up white pussies? Where are all those terrible bloods who are going to build glorious kingdoms for black soul, baby, queen mothers, the stone, stoniest foxes in the world? Where, oh where? Probably somewhere getting high. Salam continues on to call for black writers to stop driving and instead to do something constructive and intentional with their words. To use their words as weapons, what we might call he concludes his food for thought by expanding upon his earlier demand for control. He advocates, and two, we, black writers, must develop something, call it craftsmanship or whatever, the doing, the ability to do, the control to get it done so that it conveys the message it's supposed to, the messages we need to put forth. So as we say, we must have control. We are calling for the poets to control their words, control the meaning and the production control it all. And finally, we are calling for some thought, some analyzing of our collective situation, some neat inspections of the flesh, ours and our oppressors. Inspect and project. All praises do the black man, his woman, and his children too. In his call for control, Salon points back to histories of the racist hegemonic structures of transatlantic slavery and their still present afterlives that attempted to control black bodies and subjectivities. Beginning in the 17th century and continuing into the 19th, approximately 20 million Africans were dispossessed of their lands and homes due to the Atlanta slave trade. Enslaved peoples provided the labor force necessary for the growth of capitalism in the Western world. Traces of the racist logics that undergirded the beginnings of capitalism remain integral to the functioning of this system during the second half of the 20th century and arguably continue today. Although the legislation and discourse around black bodies and black lives have evolved throughout the history of the post bellum United States, the ruling of symbolic epistemy has not. As articulated by black feminist scholar Fortin Spillers, even though the captive flesh body has been liberated, and no one need pretend that even the quotation marks do not matter, dominant symbolic activity, the ruling epistemy that releases the dynamics of naming and valuation, remains grounded in the originating metaphors of captivity and mutilation, so that it is as if neither time nor history, nor historiography in its topics, show movement, as if, as the human subject is murdered over and over again by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous archaism, showing itself in endless disguise. For Spillers, a change in rhetoric simply disguises the continued symbolic violence enacted upon black subjects. The emancipation of slaves did not alter the ruling epistemy that classified blacks as less than human. Following the Civil War, due to limited availability of other jobs, many blacks were forced to work on plantations or other jobs through a system of indebted servitude, which made slavery and everything by name. Vagrancy laws in the conflict lease system further contributed to slavery-like conditions, despite official emancipation. As articulated by Sadia Hartman, Quote, necessity was at odds with the proclaimed liberty of the volitional subject, liberal individual, since it was distinguished by encumbrance, compulsion, and utter lack of options. Necessity easily contended with the willfulness, liberty, and autonomy that purportedly delineated freedom. It exemplified all that was presumably negated by the abolition of slavery, the primacy of compulsion, the willingness of embodiment, and the sway of needs. Located in a hegemonic system that also devalues black life, Kalamu Yasalam calls on poets to continue to develop black creative writing as a political act. Cognizant of the gains made in establishing black writing aesthetics during the modern Renaissance and through the 60s, Salam advocates for words that do more than just sound pretty. For Salam, it is not enough that the black subject speaks. The words must disrupt, or in his words, the art doer does, or else be bullshit. 
But what about Salon's question of control? Earlier, I briefly reminded us of transatlantic slavery, a system mandating at the macro level black people's lack of control over their own bodies, the rendering them as commodities or flesh rather than human subjects. So there's a call for that kind of control, control over how one inhabits the world as a black subject in a racist, classist, heteropatriarchal system that continues to try and render blacks as less than human. However, Salam is also addressing poets, creative writers. He is invested in control on the symbolic, representational, ideological level. In an interview with David Scott, Jamaican theorist and novelist Sylvia Winter elaborates the difficulty of changing the ideological and representational playing fields in a different but related context. Speaking to her experiences traveling to the United States and the UK, she recalls, going to England but coming to the United States what you run into is the overt nature of the stereotype of yourself that confronts you. It's like Fanon going to France and hearing Mama look a nigger. Now in Martinique, his French colonial island, his mother had warned him, don't be a nigger. But it had never occurred to him that he himself was a nigger, since you could behave in such a way as to prove you're not a nigger. But in France, in London, no. There you're just one thing, being and behaving a nigger. So you run into these stereotypes. They're all around you part of the unconscious way of thinking, and so it becomes imperative to confront those stereotypes. And I would say the guiding thread that has lasted all through my work is, how do you deal with the stereotyped view of yourself that you yourself have been socialized to accept? Because the stereotypes are not arbitrary. It's not a matter of someone getting up and suddenly being racist. It is that given the conception of what it means to be human, to be an imperial English man or woman, you had to be seen by them as the negation of what they were. So you, too, had to circumcise yourself of yourself in order to be fully human. In this excerpt, Winter details, albeit in the colonialist model, right, which is not what we're talking about for the US, the difficulty of establishing a self or collective fashioning of blackness that isn't entrenched in the racist ideological structures in which black subjects have been educated. Returning back to Salon, if the lens through which one sees the world is the one provided by the oppressor, how does one perform meat inspections of the flesh, ours and our oppressors, that get us to the language, the structure, the poetry that elaborates blackness as fully human? How do we control the meaning of blackness, black subjectivity, black life? How do we control it all? The short answer is we can't control it all, that is. The long answer, well, you'll have to read my dissertation for that one. <laughs> for now, let's turn to two examples from Nkambo, written by Brothers in Confinement, that illustrate an attempt to control representations of quote-unquote authentic black femininity. Please note that although I'm focusing on these two examples, the ideas or what might, some might call ideologies expressed in the examples are recurrent throughout other works published by Nkambo. The first is a short story entitled The Woman from the Movies was published in the June 1971 issue. The second is an excerpt from an essay about prison life in Missouri State Penitentiary from Nkambo's 1974 issue. The section of interest in that essay is entitled The Penitentiary Woman. Now there's a lot happening in both The Penitentiary Woman and The Woman from the Movies not the least of which are questionable gender and sexual politics, as well as critiques of dominant representations of black women in the prison system. But I want to focus on is each work's portrayal of true black femininity or black womanhood. The woman from the movies. He first saw her as he turned from the window. He wasn't surprised that she should be here. He had always expected to meet her outside of fantasy. Now his eyes moved over her slowly, taking in everything from the blonde bush on her head to the clinging pink mini she wore. She was not the one he had seen before. At least the face was different from the many she had in the movies. But she was the same as the movies were always the same now. He thought he should ask who she was. It came out. What are you supposed to be representing now? I am your sex symbol, the black sex symbol. Her voice was soft and low. What's your name, he asked. Whatever name you give me. She moved toward the bed from her place by the door. Her eyes never left his face as she sat down on the bed and crossed her legs. Come, sit with me, she said, hiding a place beside her. 
He felt sweat on his forehead and knew it was the beginning of the nameless fear he felt at the movies. Her green eyes gleamed in her cool black face, seeming to reach out and touch him physically. No, he said. I'll stand here. She smiled. Are you afraid of me? No, he lied. Then sit with me. He looked past her to the still form of his wife, lying on the bed. The woman seemed to read his thoughts. She will not awaken, she said. Come and sit here. He felt himself drawn to sit beside her. Why do you fear me? I don't know. I only know that something is wrong about you, something evil. She laughed softly. How can I be evil? I am what you created, what you want. He had, ha he had not looked into her face since he moved to sit down. He did now and felt the quick movement of his stomach. I didn't create you. You just came into my life when your master sent you. But I am there, here, because you want me to be, she said. Without you, I would not be. He glanced at her eyes again. They were blue now. Your eyes, he said. Why are your eyes always a different color? And hair, and face. Because I am many different people. I am all of those that are your symbols. But why are they those colors, he said. You're supposed to be black. Yes, his fear was gone now. He felt only a slow anger mounting and spreading all through his body. I know another name for you, he almost whispered. Propaganda. He sent you to destroy us, bitch. She gave a sudden jerk as if he had struck her. No, she said, you created me. I am real. He began to laugh again. He threw back his head and gave great shouts of sound that shook his body. Stop it, she cried. Stop it. You can't laugh at me like that. He stopped. Don't you know that I represent the highest position that the black woman can reach, she asked? You represent nothing. <coughs> I represent all black women. With a blonde wig and green eyes, you symbolize nothing. I represent all black women, she said again. Are you all black women prostitutes, whores and bitches, he said? I represent all black women, she repeated. He looked down at his sleeping wife. You say that I made you? Yes, she said. That's a lie, but I know how to destroy you. She was up off the bed, back and toward the door. He smiled at her. I know how to destroy you because you are alive. No, she pleaded. I know your master and why you came here, but he doesn't understand that I don't need you. He placed his hand beside his wife's face. He turned her face toward the woman who now stood at the door. Look at her, he said. This is the reason that you aren't real. You can't exist because your master can never let you portray her. He laughed at the fear in the woman's eyes. She's too strong. This is the reason that you aren't real. You can't, sorry, again. She is too strong. My woman is too strong in her beauty, her love, her loyalty. You portray nothing. I can return, she said. I can show you a new face. No, because I would know you no matter how you came back. He looked into his wife's face a long moment. I would know you and her strength would make me destroy you. He left the bed and went to stand by the window again. He wondered how many of the men passing below had met this woman and recognized her. How many of them had had a woman to drive them to reject her lives? Across the street from his building, saw a figure pause as if looking up at the window. It was too far down to tell if it was a man or a woman in the door, and it really didn't matter much anyway. It didn't matter at all. When he turned from the window, the woman was gone. He slipped into bed beside his wife, and gently shook her away. That uh, short story was live anyway. So keeping what we just read in mind, um, we're going to read a much shorter excerpt from the penitentiary woman, which comes from a longer essay, again, about the Missouri State Penitentiary. Same images, by the way. Okay. The Penitentiary Woman. There are some homos in prison who sell their rectum just as a prostitute on the street sells herself to men. Only here in the pen, they don't call them punks and homos. They call them girls and women. So hereafter, the homo will be referred to as a woman. When the prisoner who has graduated from the wet dream of jacking off get tired of jacking off, he will want to try a penitentiary woman. Right here, the reader is asked to, try to use a little imagination. Just picture a man who, over a year, has been having wet dreams and jacking off, suddenly being confronted with a man who has been a homer from his childhood, who has practiced acting, talking, and even looking like a woman. Who asked this man who is jacking off Sorry, who, has, who asked this man who has a jacking off habit, do you want some pussy? This penitentiary woman wears tight pants that are made to resemble a woman's pants, wears an afro very high, or wears hair like the white woman. 
He, she has very long fingernails, a carefully shaven face, wears perfume, etc. After submitting to this woman, the deprived inmate will be in real trouble. The fantasy that he once had is now devilful. He thinks he now has the real thing. He calls it pussy and calls it this, boy or girl. If he can buy this boy from his man, he will. I have seen men buy these boys for several hundred dollars or rent them for months at a time. They even kiss, marry, and set up house like husband and wife. You can lose your life by touching a man's wife here in prison quicker than on the street. I have seen men who treat women like trash on the street, treat these boys like queens. The reason is that these men have lost everything. They have lost their real wives, children, dignity, and everything. The only thing that they have is this boy to make them bear this burden of a sentence. They fall deeply in love with these boys for the same reason. Their love is deeper than that of some men and women because all they have left in this world is each other. These men will kill your dirty underwear over these boys. To go a little deeper, let's explore the cells. In the cells, there are two men. Now, you can't make a man out of a woman. You can try, but a man is a man. He grows a mustache, beard, and has everything that all men have. You can't get the man out of a man. He was born a man, and a man he is. There are some men who look like women, and there are some women who look like men. But men are men, and women are women, and that's that. And then he puts in parentheses. I once had a woman who really looked rough and masculine, but she was a woman and as feminine as they come. She cried a lot, bled every month, had two lovely tits and a vagina, and a very beautiful mind. She wasn't as beautiful as some people, but there was no other woman as feminine, thoughtful, and intelligent as she. She was a woman. And it continues to go on. I can send you if you want to finish it again. That's it. That is enough for now. Based on these readings, what does a black woman look like? Right, and we're thinking here during the 70s, uh, late 1960s, uh, during the black arts movement. Okay, so based on these readings, what does a black woman look like? Why are your eyes always a different color? And hair, and face. Why are they those colors, he said, you're supposed to be black. This penitentiary woman wears tight pants, wears an afro very high, or wears hair like the white woman. He, she has very long fingernails. What are the roles of the black woman? There should be a law allowing men to see women once a month. Prisoners breed perversion because men cannot forget women. He wondered how many of the men passing below had met this woman and recognized her. How many of them had had a woman to drive them to reject their lives? What I'm trying to get at is regardless of if the portrayal is of a cisgender black woman or a quote unquote penitentiary woman, through which chosen publication, Nkambo articulates one, a singular depiction of what a black woman is or can be, and two, the black woman as object, as tool, as a means to an end for black men, and in doing so, contributes to the codification of a specific form of black womanhood that reifies the racialized, sexualized, and gendered objection of non-conforming black bodies from the category human. In short, these male-created fantasies about black femininity contribute to the hegemonic racial sexual domination project Therefore, while I agree with Salam that fighting is preparation and being ready, and that black art can help us do that, I want to push back on his call for control, or at least his call for controlling it all. Thank you. <laughs> so now we open up for Q&A. Um, yeah, okay, Q&A. Thank you all again for coming. Sean. I wonder if you could think of not about the hegemonic, because hegemonic is Kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's, I mean, the example you're giving is so, especially in the queer one, is does I make mean, to align that as hegemonic, you're going to run into problems eventually, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not in a different track. So I wonder if you could just play with that a little bit more and think about like what can you nuance that a little bit and think okay, so what, it was, if it does do something hegemonic, it'll be fine. But then what else is it doing in the example and what's being performed exactly? Because I think that's Great, thank you for your question. So what I'm interested there, particularly thinking about depictions of same-sex desire, right? So in the piece um, that I read, the term homo was used, and I'm assuming, but the assumption that I'm making is there's not much differentiation between um, desire, right, versus the way that people identify. And so one of the things that I'm also interested in is, first of all, this idea of what a black woman is, right? So if they're defining saying this homo, 
right? Um, these people who are having sex, um, these men who are having sex with other men um, are acting like women, right? So first of all, if they're acting like women, there's, there's an assumption there of women's heterosexuality, right? That all these women, that women sleep with men. So there's that there that I'm interested in, right? And then I'm also interested in, so this comes from a larger piece. And so in the article, he also talks about um, forms of community, right? So for example, there's like the black Muslims who are in prison, um, who are in prison. And he talks about, um, irregardless of people's sexuality, right? Sexuality falls out of the question when it's um, done first, for example, the, the state, or the state in this instance being like the prison guards, for example. Right, so I'm interested in the ways in which I'm interested in critiquing not only, I mean, the homophobic, the homophobia that's going on, but also the ways in which sexuality comes to not matter in radical forms of community making, which I think are happening, right? I think they're happening in today's prison system. I think they're also happening in the 70s. Right? And I think that radical forms of communication have been happening since, well, at least as long as um, Africans have been brought over to the, um, to the Americas. Yeah, thank you. That's something I'll think more about. Can I answer your question? I don't know that I'm going to Okay. So, I'm just trying to uh, clarify for myself. So, when you were talking about, when you're examining black women, in the queer context or in a non queer context, using those examples, it is predicated on sex or, or desire. Like, woman defined, or the performance of woman, is predicated in this desire space. I just want to be clear. Is that. Is that where we're situating it, or are we situating, or are we complicating the notion of woman? So I'm, I'm complicating the notion of woman, okay. right? So I'm critiquing the representation of what a woman is, as if there is a single definition of what a woman can be, right? Right. And so what I'm arguing is that in different pieces in the cover, not just from the brothers and confinement sections, right? right, but the articulation of what a, not just a black woman, what a good black woman is, right? right. So. Um, you saw earlier, for example, if you look at this picture. So we have um, pictures of black women on most of the covers of Nakamba. Right. What does a black woman look like, right? So we heard in the, the short story, the critique of a black woman who wears like a weave, for example, right? Or who strains her hair. And so looking at all the covers of Nakamba, oh, the black woman has an afro. The black woman um, is darker toned, right? So it's a mixed race. How black are they actually, right? So. I'm thinking about um, women in that sense, right? The representation of this ideology of what a black woman is. I mean, also, I'm interested in pointing to, again, the multiplicity of what a black woman entails, right? Because black women, again, so that's, you can think biological, right? And I think oftentimes, um, at least in the pieces that I've examined so far, that they're using the term woman biologically, except for, for example, when they say, we're using the term woman to describe a woman. Right. Right? But I'm also interested in complicating um, notions of women by thinking about how people self-identify, right? And also that women is a necessary, so gender roles are necessarily tied to whatever the biological gender is, right? Yes. Well, no, I mean, just, I'm sorry, but uh, see, this is the thing which I think is compelling, is because the black woman defined, if you take, and this is only one mo mode of performance, white male performativity of black womanhood is often the nurturing, Aunt Jemima is the performative space that that exists in, you know? And that's historically from, you know, you can hold that. And then the, the, the sassafras, sexualized, hypersexualized thing is the later 20th century mode of black woman performativity. I'm just curious, and I'm just curious, just thinking, it's like, are you positing that black men hold the latter and not the former nurturing space at all when, when we're reading these things? No, I would disagree. Yeah. Um, I think we're looking at, um, at the example of the short story. Uh -huh. So one of the, I mean, I don't speak on it really here, but one of the things that I'm very interested in is, although I'm critiquing like this, a singularized version of what a black woman is, also like um, Benny Brooks is critiquing these representations of black women. Like this is not, like black women aren't just whores, prostitutes, whatever, that um, they're not necessarily uh, trying to be like a white woman, which is what he's arguing is what all the media depictions are, is that this is what a black woman is. This is the only way that a black woman is desirable. Right, and so I think that Benny is pulling, is critiquing that. Um, I have some issues the way that he's critiquing, okay. but I think that's the critique that he is doing, okay. right? Um, and I think he's also blurring the line between the anti and the sexualized. Mm -hmm. He's like, there's something else that's there. That okay. that is not what a black woman is. So I enjoy that. Did you what, did you come across women writers in the in the 
general. Yes, which is interesting because they are not writing about women. Not that women have to write about women. But I find it very interesting that everything I've read about women have been written by men. And what were the women writing about? Um, so they were writing about um, more like the state of the South, for example. Um, Social political. Yeah, so I, I just want to kind of comment on the whole structure of the talk. Because um, you start out with this uh, taxonomies or different layers of how we can engage with geographies and then move on to this particular um, archival research and its results. And I'm having a little bit of trouble going back to the introduction and how that can be more uh, extensively read or interpreted through your case study. So, um, I think it might be really helpful to engage with uh, geographies of incarceration, not only in this penitentiary system, but incarceration in one's own body, trapped in the skin color, the types of bodies that are performing in this, you know, networks of stereotyping and whatnot, system of racism. So I wonder if you can engage a little more about the geographies of incarceration, particularly in relation to those um, examples that you played out. Great, thank you for that. So geographies um, in a few ways. So one of the reasons that I spent so much time trying to delineate what I mean by spatial dispossession in geography is because geography we often think about physical space, right? And I'm interested in more than that, right? So there's representational space, but also ideological, right? So what's happening? Um, thinking back to the winter example, um, when she talks about going to England or coming to the United States, that her question is, if you're raised in this ideology, how do you think of something outside of the structure, right? It's necessarily tied to the structure. And so if we're thinking about geographies of incarceration, and particularly thinking about um, the combo, so the two examples, let's start with the, um, the blanking. Oh, the penitentiary woman example. So if we're thinking about black geographies, so one of the things that the structure of the essay, and this is our state prison, is, is a geography, right? He's laying out the different dimensions of the prison, right? Not physical space, but the way that the prison operates as a whole, right? So thinking about, um, he's thinking about different social relationships happening inside the prison, but also outside the prison, right? So for example, at the end, he's the end of the penitentiary woman section, He's like, oh, that um, they should allow women to come to prison so that men can fuck women and then there won't be all these homeless in prison. Right? That's basically what his argument is, right? And so if we're thinking about, about the geography and the fact that there aren't um, people who are biologically men all in the same prison, right? Um, and also in their single or multi cells, so thinking about how that affects them psychologically. Right, um, being in that space with that lack of diversity, but also thinking about um, and the representational geography, as in what we're reading, what these um, these people wrote about, but also thinking about the ways in which um, ideologically, like how the geo what what types of geographies are being envisioned by brothers in confinement that we aren't seeing elsewhere, right? And that's my real question. So while I'm interested in critiquing again the homophobia, sexism, all that jazz, wonderful. I mean. I that all the time, but what I'm really interested in is, is it, what I think what happens at spaces of dispossession, particularly homelessness and incarceration, is that because most of the time people are kicked out of the structure, right? The idea is to put them away somewhere else. So while they're still tied to the structure, there is some type of outsideness, and I think that's the spaces where we can think about different ways of inhabiting the world, and so different, um, elaborate different types of geographies are making geographies more livable. Um, so if you were to give this talk to me, I think to add those more reflective analytic moments might really be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm also wondering, because the categories that you generalize then are about prison space, but the fact is you're in the South specifically and you don't really address that as such. Mm -hmm. And I think, because, and especially in New Orleans, right, it's, it's on the Caribbean. So, because I was thinking when you gave the first example, you know, Amy um, Césaire wrote a poetry collection called for Miraculous Arms of, around the same time, I think. Around, I think I didn't think it, but it's, it was yeah, pretty close. So I'm just curious, like, I don't know what the circulation might be, but it's also a moment, like, if you live in New Orleans, in that moment in time, you have all of the decolonial movements that just happened, like Jamaica, Trinidad, and they've all just reached independence. It's a very different kind of iteration of black politics and also very specific iterations of gender in relation to black politics. Versus like California and Black Panthers and so on, I mean, there's a very good, like very specific and different locations. So I wonder, 
if you could flesh that out a little bit, I think it would do a lot for the project. And also to think about also queer genealogy, because also Stonewall, you know, and, that, and the specific kind of LGBT genealogy is also happening in different kind of space. In New Orleans. Yeah. yeah. So I think it might be really interesting to like sort of add in those layers. And it would help us to give you like a, a more dimensionality in terms of the spaces that you're talking about. Any other special comments that you all? They have classes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you again. You all. Oh, I was just going to say, um, also colorism is a big deal that comes up. Because so the, the what does it mean for a black woman aesthetic to be too close to white? Or yeah. that, that whole thing about the blonde hair, the, whether it's an apple or not. Um, that, that has also a very particular New Orleans iteration as well. Agreed. So that's what I found so interesting, right? So this space, like the Black Art South, they're based in New Orleans, right? Um, where, so they come out of the Free Southern Theater, and one of the things that the Free Southern Theater pride themselves on is that diversity, right? That Black is a very open and um, fluid term, right? So you can they even say, and they have a whole book talking about the Free Southern Theater, like they even say, like, we have members who have, uh, they look white, they have like blonde, natural blonde hair, for example, and have blue or green eyes. Yet, what is being published in the combo does not um, does not uh, highlight that diversity, the diversity of blackness. Um, so that's something I also find very interesting, considering that it's based in New Orleans. Yet, there's a definitely one a singularized depiction of what black is or what a black woman is. And I just thought, this might take you off. You think when you were thinking about free Southern theater, I know John O'Neill. I think he's still alive, if I'm not mistaken, and he's still in New Orleans. And it's interesting to think about him having this publishing arm. John's an interesting person who started the Free Southern Theater um, and was a bit of a controlling artist in terms of the theater making, but that he allowed the combo to be published and he's not an editor, he's not, you know, that was one of the things I thought was interesting, like him giving up that level of freedom to allow other people to engage. He's a wonderful man. I'm just, I was just interested in that, like, space. Black Arts Movement Publishing, Bullens is publishing his publications in San Francisco, you know, Baraka is doing the thing in Newark, and they are the people who are the titular people of the organizations, but also very aware of what information is being disseminated from Free Southern Theater. I was just curious. I'm sure you, John is, is still around. He's older, of course, but it'd be interesting to figure out why he let this publishing arm exist in the way it does, because it seems to have it's free of his organization. Yeah, and which is something, so thinking about when um, the life of Nkumbo was. Yes. It was during the time where, I mean, Free Southern Theater had always had financial issues, yes. but they were like yes. in the heart of it, yes. right, at the time that Nkumbo was being published. And so, um, I guess John O'Neill was one of the founders, and Tom Dent um, wasn't a founder, but he was very involved from the beginning, yes. right? And so, it was Tom Dent who took and went, like, okay, we're going to do this Black um, Art South workshop with um, Val Ferdinand. Yes. And so, thinking about, like, the slippage that happened there with John yeah. O'Neill and that because because FSC was going through this hard time, there's focused on financing and fundraising in that respect and also touring, right? Yeah. And so one of the key themes of what Free Some Theater wanted to do, which is one of the reasons why there was a big split, was that who is this theater for? Right. right? Is it for communities in the South? Or are we just trying to be something more commercialized? It ended up being decided that this is for communities in the South, so there's a huge touring. Mm -hmm. Right? So the idea so thinking about how the structure of FSP and financial issues how that allowed for Black Art South to come into being in the combo is also very interesting. Um, me, I'm not big on uh, tracking institutions and finances yeah. and that stuff, but it is something very interesting to think about. Uh, so you mentioned that you know the, the idea in the South is this, this fluid idea of blackness at the time um, is circulating in this population, and yet. Obviously, the representations for that theater, for that theater. For the theater. Yeah, and then, but then, yeah, sorry, but, and then the representations that we're seeing in this publication are, are sort of fixed. Do you see the same sort of representations of black masculinity, or does that have more access to these ideas of fluidity um, than the, the images and representations of femininity? So that's good. Thank you. Um, so for the defining of black men and black masculinity, it has nothing to do with what you look like, right? Um, at least not anything that I've found. It's about, do you have a strong black woman? Is she holding you up? Um, which you can kind of get from the example that I talk about, right? Um, that a black woman is supposed to be this. You can have sex and not turn gay. A black woman is supposed to keep you from this um, white depiction of what a black woman is. You need a real strong black woman to keep you on the straight and narrow. 
right? And so the idea is, um, the idea is, I should mention the combo is on the radical side, if you didn't get that from um, the Xers, they're on the radical side. So this is a very specific idea within the black arts movement, not everyone was this radical. And so thinking about black, so um, about, I mean, about, about action, about doing something. So like, what are you doing to further help the black people, right? Um, so yeah, mas so yeah masculinity in that type of fashion, but it had like, nothing to do with what they look like. As a matter of fact, if you Google the people I mentioned, you'll see what they look like, and there's not the same standards for what a real black woman is as a real black man. <laughs> 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 I want to ask one, which may be sort of like an opening up, this is just sort of a question about your larger project, but I was thinking a lot about the geographies and the specificity of geographies, and I remember, um, so you've talked a lot about homelessness and incarceration, which I think are, is a genius juxtaposition, and now I would like to hear a little bit more about what you're seeing come out of juxtaposing New Orleans with um, Southern California, and like, just like this is sort of like a general hey, what's going on? How about those specific geographies? Yeah, great. Thank you for that question. So again, yeah, I do focus on Los Angeles and New Orleans. And so I also, so I did most of my research at Dillard University in the Augusta Research Center. Um, but I also went to the State Archives of Baton Rouge. And so I don't know if you've ever been there, but she has a whole bunch of old writers sitting at like this. <laughs> and so I go, and she's like, oh, what are you looking for? I was like, oh, I want to look at like the levees, because I know the prisoners were like, where you're making lunch, like, don't they have levees in California? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm sure they do, but that has nothing to do with them. I was like, so, I mean, it's a similar question, but it's like in a different like sort of way, like, why are you here? Like, why do you come all the way back to for some levees? <laughs> so, a few things. So I'm thinking about Los Angeles and, um, and New Orleans. So, technically, Los Angeles is the South, but if you've ever been to the East Coast and the South, it's not the South. Right? Um, the ideologies are different, um, people's experiences, the landscape is different, which, I mean, just the land, the geography in itself is going to affect the ways in which um, you encounter the world. And so what I find very interesting about Los Angeles um, versus New Orleans versus South South, if that makes sense, like super South, is that thinking that the radicalism that was happening in, in LA, in California, in Oakland, for example, there was radicalism happening in New Orleans and the South as well, it just looked different, right? And so some of it has to do with geography, but also my question is, what else? What else, why? So if they had the same idea about being radical about, I don't want to say uplifting black people, because that's very, and it's not the term I want to use. But so thinking about how these, um, how in both places, and also in New York, but I'm less interested there, because I want to talk about New York, how these two places have these, have similar ideas of um, being radical and changing the status quo, representations of what black people are, and also um, different ideas of what a black community might look like, right, outside of a racist structure, that what a lot, what, um, what was the catalyst for the different types of radicalism that was happening in these two sides? Yes. Well, thank you.